Imagine chilling out in your headquarters, knowing that your enemy is thousands of miles away and has little to no chances of getting within range. They're welcome to try, but they will have to negotiate first your mighty air, sea, and ground-based defenses, to say nothing of your state-of-the-art radars. They're capable of detecting an incoming aircraft or missile with enough advance notice to deploy an effective countermeasure. But then, your buddy sitting at the radar screen raises the alarm. Something is zooming towards you, and it's really, really, really fast. Five times as fast as the speed of sound, to be precise. But why did you detect it so late? And what is it? Is it a plane? Is it a bird? No, it's a common hypersonic glide body, the tip of the spear of America's latest piece of hypersonic destructive kit. Official US Army publications describe it as, quoting here, a new class of weapon for the Army and Department of Defense and is the nation's first operational hypersonic weapon. Its official name is Long Range Hypersonic Weapon, or LRHW, but it's better known by its ominous nickname, the Dark Eagle. Why Dark Eagle? Okay, we couldn't find an origin story to this moniker, but it's possibly a better choice than, I don't know, brightly colored canary or something. But the Dark Eagle is sometimes referred to in the media as a missile or a service-to-service -service weapon or a hypersonic weapon. If we want to be extremely pedantic, and let's face it, we absolutely do, the Dark Eagle is a weapon system, i.e. an integrated combination of vehicles, payloads, and other equipment intended to operate and deliver a certain weapon against its target. We shall explore later, more in detail, what are its components and how they interact together. Get ready for that. But for the moment, let's take a look at the broader class of armament to which the LRHW belongs, unless hypersonic weapons or simply hypersonics. These could be defined as intermediate and long-range maneuvering weapons which fly at speeds of at least Mach 5, i.e. more than 3,800 miles per hour, or over 6,100 kilometers per hour. That is fast. In lay terms, we're talking about stuff that's going to hit you hard and from afar while traveling more than five times faster than sound, all while following an unpredictable trajectory which will make detection and interception oh so very difficult. Now, hypersonics largely belong to two main categories, hypersonic cruise missiles and hypersonic glide vehicles, or HGVs, and no, not heavy goods vehicles. These vehicles are mounted on booster rockets before being released and gliding toward their target. HGVs and the supporting systems have been of particular interest to the US military since the early 2000s. According to General John Hyten, former commander of US Strategic Command, HGVs could enable, quoting him here, responsive long-range strike options against distant defended and or time critical threats such as road mobile missiles when other forces are unavailable, denied access, or not preferred. The LRHW system fits within this brief. As reported by the Army AL&T magazine, quote, the LRHW system enables rapid and precise strikes against time-sensitive or heavily defended targets at hypersonic speeds over long distances. And according to Congressional Research Service, the purpose of the LRHW system is to provide the US military with, quoting them here, strategic attack weapons system to defeat anti-access aerial denial, A2AD capabilities, suppress adversary long-range fire, and engage other high payoff time critical targets. And just to clarify here, A2 AD capabilities involve preventing an enemy from approaching or operating within an area of strategic interest. A military force would typically do so by deploying ground based missile batteries, artillery, or other defensive assets. Now, official military and congressional sources do not specify who might be this potential enemy with highly advanced A2 AD capabilities. But in the analysis of the think tank International Institute of Strategic Studies, the Dark Eagle and hypersonics in general are being developed with a specific adversary in mind, and that's China. Beijing, in fact, has a well-developed set of A2AD defenses in the Pacific. Not only that, the People's Liberation Army, or PLA, appears to be one step ahead in the field of hypersonics. All right, so the saga of the Dark Eagle took off in March 2019, when U.S. Army Chief of Staff James Charles McConville signed off on the accelerated development and delivery of a prototype ground-launched hypersonic weapon. In April, the brief was assigned to the Army's Rapid Capabilities and Critical Technologies Office, or RCCTO. By 2020, this office had produced an abbreviated capability development document, uh, which confirms the need for executing rapid experimentation on new hypersonic weapon prototypes. So, the need to develop these new pieces of kit had been identified and formalized in this nice document with a ridiculous name, just like everything else in today's episode. That's all fine and dandy. 
But thus far, no tangible progress had actually been made. The project got a nice kick up the rear end thruster only in early 2021. That's when the Pentagon found out that China's People's Liberation Army had been developing an intermediate range ballistic missile equipped with a nuclear capable hypersonic glide vehicle. The missile could fly a distance of up to 4,900 miles, that's 8,000 kilometers, before releasing the HGV, which would then strike at the intended target. This new weapon would not be a direct threat to Hawaii, let alone the US mainland, but it could cause a serious headache to America's allies in the Asia Pacific region. Hence, the DoD had to keep up with Chinese developments, and in May, it issued a funding request to Congress amounting to $3.8 billion for projects related to the research, development, and initial procurement of hypersonic weapons for fiscal year 2022. Now, the Congress and President Biden authorized the request in December 2021, thus enabling the Army and Navy to issue requests for proposals to their vendors. The highly ambitious and aggressive goal was to deliver the new hypersonic weapon, the LRHW, by the end of 2023. Now, we should specify slash remind you at this stage that the terms LRHW or Dark Eagle do not simply refer to a missile, but a complex weapon system, which includes many components. Now, the first component will be the Transporter Erector Launchers, or TALs. Each TAL will house and fire two missiles and will be mounted on an M870A4 trailer. A group of four TALs will constitute a battery to be complemented by a Battery Operations Center, or BOC, and a BOC support vehicle in charge of command and control. The contract to develop the TELS, BOC, and their associated systems and software was awarded to Lockheed Martin. As per the missiles, each will include two components, the missile proper and the hypersonic glide vehicle, or HGV. In this case, the latter is referred to as the Common Hypersonic Glide Body, or CHGB, to be developed by Dynetics, a subsidiary of LADOS. Dynetics did not have to start their work from scratch, though. They based their concept on a pre-existing HGV developed by the Army themselves with Sandia National Laboratories. This was the Advanced Hypersonic Weapon, or AHW, later known as Alternate Reentry System, first tested in November 2011. And finally, for the missile proper. This is an all-up round, or AUR missile, developed in-house by the US Navy's conventional prompt strike program. The LRHW is a fine example of close cooperation between the public and private sectors to develop an integrated weapon system. But how does each part work in relation to the other? Here is a possible scenario. Let's pretend that you're an officer in charge of a battery when the worst happens. A new war is declared and your superiors have identified a high value target. Excellent stuff, let's turn it to rubble. Well, I mean, not so fast. The problem is that your enemy has advanced A2 AD capabilities, and that means that they've got some pretty good long range weapons which can easily blow up your aircraft, naval vessels, or tanks if they try to get a bit too cozy. All right, so then you might think about well, shooting a good old fashioned ballistic missile off. Well, it appears that your enemy can deploy some serious defensive kit, including radars which may detect an incoming missile hundreds, even thousands of miles before it reaches its target. Well, that's where you come in, as the Dark Eagle system can get to their target potentially faster than a ballistic missile and with much higher chances of avoiding detection, all the while staying at a safe distance. So, from your Battery Operations Center, the BOC, or check the coordinates of the target, mindful that the maximum operational range of the Dark Eagle is 1,725 miles, or 2,776 kilometers. If the target's within range, then, yeah, you're gonna get the order to fire. One of the trailers in your battery is gonna get into position. Then its transporter erector launcher, those tells we talked about before, will, well, it'll get erect and it'll fire the missile. The AUR provided by your buddies in the Navy will accelerate above hypersonic speeds and soar above the atmosphere. Once it reaches the right altitude, the missile will release the CHGB, which will follow an arching trajectory until it re-enters the atmosphere. Then the glider will level out at a height of around 30 miles or 50 kilometers above the surface and zoom towards your intended target at a speed well above Mach 5. If needed, from the safety of your BOC, you will be able to maneuver the CHGB as needed until it delivers its deadly explosive payload. Thus, by combining high speeds, maneuverability, and low altitude of flight, the Dark Eagle's glider vehicle will be able to baffle the enemy defenses. Their radars may pick up on its approach, but it will likely be too late for them to take any action. 
The development of the Dark Eagle program got off to a good start, zooming through its initial milestones. As mentioned, the system included an already existing Navy booster missile and a glide vehicle based on a pre-existing model. This allowed the Army and the Navy to execute a first test as early as June 2022. During this exercise, however, the AUR missile carrying the CHGB vehicle failed a test flight. This was kind of awkward, as the purpose of the exercise was to test the CHGB, not the rocket, which means that defense officials categorized the outcome as a no test, as the gliding vehicle didn't even have a chance to deploy. The Army alone took charge of the follow-up trial, dubbed Joint Flight Campaign 2, when a missile would be fired from Cape Canaveral, Florida on March 5, 2023. But as noted by a congressional report, quote, as a result of pre-flight checks during that event, the test did not occur. On September 6, 2023, the test was replicated, but once again, quote, as a result of pre-flight checks during that event, the test did not occur. Eight days later, the Army released a statement acknowledging that they would not meet the goal of deploying the LRHW by the end of the year. In June 2024, the US Congress received an update from the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, according to which, quote, the Army missed its goal of fielding the first LRHW battery, including missiles, by fiscal year 2023 due to integration challenges. Based on current test and missile production plans, the Army will not field its first complete LRHW battery until fiscal year 2025. Now, the GAO report said that if the Army wanted to deploy an operational system, first it had to conduct a successful end-to-end -end flight of a Dark Eagle missile. And, well, would you believe it? On June the 28th, the DoD proudly announced that the Army and the Navy had indeed nailed an end-to-end -end test flight. A two-stage missile was fired from the Pacific Missile Range Facility, Kauai in Hawaii. It completed its intended course before releasing the CHGB, which then glided without hitches towards its target, a test range in the Marshall Islands. Apparently, the Dark Eagle's hypersonic glide vehicle covered a distance of 2,000 miles, which is 275 more than expected. Following this success, U.S. Army officials stated that the first eight missiles would be delivered within 11 months. Therefore, the Dark Eagle system could be operational around mid-2025, and the first battery will be delivered to the 5th Battalion, 3rd Field Artillery Regiment, based at Joint Base lewis McCord in Washington. So, it appears all well and good for the Dark Eagle project. Despite the setbacks encountered during testing, all seems to be back on track, and the DoD has secured the required budget to complete the next milestones in the fiscal year 2025. But after that, the future of LRHW appears more uncertain. In August 2024, the Congressional Research Service issued the report Hypersonic Weapons, Backgrounds and Issues for Congress, which highlights how the Dark Eagle and hypersonic weapons in general have many critics within the US government. According to them, these systems, quote, contribute little to US military capability capability and are unnecessary for deterrence. The report goes on to highlight the drawbacks of hypersonics, starting with cost. According to Department of Defense estimates, the entire LRHW program will cost the taxpayer some $6.9 billion. This budget should cover the initial research, development, and testing work, as well as the production of 66 missiles, i.e. a cost per unit of $106 million. The cost per unit of future batches is not possible to estimate at this stage, but it's likely to be higher than the average cost of ballistic missile systems. According to a January 2023 report by the Center for Strategic and International Studies, quoting them here, their high costs limit inventories, so they lack the volume needed to counter the immense numbers of Chinese air and naval platforms. Some officials within the DoD appear unconcerned by the price tag attached to the Dark Eagle and similar projects and are willing to deploy hundreds of hypersonic weapons. Former Director of Defense Research and Engineering Mark Lewis, for example, noted how the department intended, quote, to deliver hypersonics at scale. That means hundreds of weapons in a short period of time in the hands of the warfighter. And Principal Director for Hypersonics Mike White confirmed that the DoD planned to, quote, produce hypersonics in mass because you have to be able to deliver capability in meaningful numbers, even to defeat the high-end targets. Air Force Secretary Frank Kendall begged to disagree, though, quoting him here, Hypersonics are not going to be cheap anytime soon, and thus we're more likely to have relatively small inventories of hypersonic missiles than large ones. Now, beside cost, US hypersonics may have another inherent limitation. As opposed to their Chinese counterparts, they are not designed for potential nuclear use. The implication is, if you fit your hypersonic glide vehicle with a conventional warhead, you have to make it really, really accurate if you want to blow up your target. And higher accuracy requires more advanced guiding technology and extensive testing. But even if the DoD were able to foot the bill and undergo additional R&D and testing, would it even be worth it? 
According to a Congressional Budget Office assessment of hypersonic weapons, well, not really. Their conclusion was that traditional ballistic missiles would be cheaper than hypersonics and perform just as well. And when pitted against the air defenses of a well-funded military, the likes of Dark Eagle missiles, quote, would probably not be more survivable than ballistic missiles with maneuverable warheads in a conflict unless the ballistic missiles encountered highly effective long-range defenses. There is yet another consideration, as pointed out by the Congressional Research Service analysis. Lockheed and Dynetics were able to deliver against their original contract, certainly, but if the DoD intends to increase demand for Dark Eagles, they may lack the ability to fulfill these orders. More in general, quote, U.S. government officials have expressed ongoing concern about the ability of the industrial base to support future demand for hypersonic weapons. Even if the Army and Navy were happy with their initial order of 66 missiles, they would still need to solve the issue of placement. As mentioned at the beginning, the Dark Eagle systems are most likely to be deployed in the Asia-Pacific region, directed at high-value targets on mainland China. But where exactly? The International Institute for Strategic Studies, or IISS, tried to answer this very question in their January 2024 paper, Long Range Strike Capabilities in the Asia-Pacific, Implications for Regional Stability. The natural choice would be to deploy the TELs in a US-controlled territory, namely the island of Guam. But we have to consider the maximum operational range of the Dark Eagle missiles at 1,725 miles or 2,776 kilometers. One of these weapons, if fired from Guam, may reach naval targets in the Pacific and the eastern sectors of the South China Sea, but it would have zero chances of reaching mainland China. Well, how about placing the TELs in an allied country, such as Japan? Well, that would be the perfect choice, geographically speaking. Washington and Tokyo, however, last discussed the placement of American long-range weapons back in December 2019, and Japanese diplomacy appeared to not be on board with the idea. South Korea who would make for another good candidate, but according to the IISS report, its government may be unwilling to antagonize China in such a direct way. The U.S. could potentially rely on further regional allies such as Thailand and the Philippines. The former has drawn closer to China in the past decade, making the latter a more likely candidate. In fact, in February 2023, Manila announced that U.S. forces would be able to set up new bases in northern Luzon. Great location, certainly, but access to this prime real estate is granted by the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, which does not explicitly guarantee permission to host American long-range weapon systems. Finally, would Australia be happy for the US military to park a couple of tail trailers on its northern coast? Well, yeah, probably, but it wouldn't be any good as southern China and even the South China Sea would be well out of range of the Dark Eagle missiles. The IISS report eventually suggests that the best short-term solution would be to, quote, continue relying predominantly on its existing extensive air and sea-launched weapons, which hints at a potential future development of the LRHW as a naval-only weapon system. So, what is apparent from the analysis about the LRHW Dark Eagle is that it carries a significant amount of baggage. The TELs, boosters, and glide vehicles in themselves may be technically feasible, effective, and on their way to delivery. But for the entire system to provide a tangible strategic advantage, the Department of Defense, in cooperation with the Department of State, may first need to solve some rather complex issues related to funding, industrial capabilities, and relationship with allies in the Asia-Pacific region. And thus, we return to a question that we already asked. Is the effort worth it, or are hypersonics a red herring, distracting valuable defense resources from other pursuits? As early as June 2022, this suggestion was raised by Colonel David Papalado, France's Air and Special Attaché in Washington. In his paper, Hypersonics Between Rhetoric and Reality, he advised France, the US, and other NATO countries to explore the potential of hypersonic missile weapons, certainly, but these militaries should not overlook cheaper and more accessible technologies such as cruise missiles, drones, or loitering munitions. The risk, in his view, is that NATO may be dragged by potential adversary powers into a hypersonics arms race. In his words, the label hypersonic must not become the bullfighter's cape used to lure and exhaust the opponent into the arena of strategic competition. And thank you for watching. <laughs> <laughs>